All right. Does anybody have a really cool one? Like the most amazing, you've met someone like famous or even just a solid story? Yes. Jill Briscoe. I know who that is, but help us. Awesome. Cool. That's good. So Jill Briscoe is an evangelist. You said married to an evangelist, has like written books and yeah, and how Robin described her is she has a gift with words, she has a passion, a commitment to evangelism and the gospel, and even equipping other people to do that too, right? Anybody else? That's a great one. Say that again. Brooke, Brooke Shields and Kathy Ireland. <laughs> I've heard of them. Where'd you meet them? New York. Awesome. Why were they amazing? Next one. Next person. Yeah. Johnny Maxwell. John Maxwell. You call him Johnny. You're so close with John Maxwell, you call him Johnny. Me and Johnny Maxwell, uh, if you don't know, I know John Maxwell. I've read some of his books, right? He's a leadership coach, pastor, speaker. How would you describe him? Like, what's one way that you would describe? Because we can't have Jeff answer that. <laughs> leadership guru, right? Committed to, right? He does. He keeps putting out more and more books, and he's always trying to help people develop more. Anybody else? Another one. Doesn't have to be a super famous person. Yeah, go for it. Uh, I'm with Barbara Houston. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, come on. Hmm. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, so Keith mentioned, uh, you said Barbara Houston was her name. Not Nothing, not well known, but just steady and faithful and made you feel the love of Jesus whenever you encountered with her, right? That's great. The people that make an impression on us, often we want to model ourselves after them. Maybe it's an evangelist that we go, I could be more like that, or a leadership coach, or um, maybe a person like that who doesn't have a claim or fame, and we just go, what if I were to live like that? Uh, when we're continuing our journey through Colossians. We said last week it is a 10-year-old church. Paul starts the letter to this young church, uh, probably smaller group than us, and he does it by affirming, first of all, their love. He says, I know that the gospel is taking root because you're loving each other. You're committing to one another's best at cost to yourself. That's what love is. He's talking about all these things. He says, and I'm choosing to pray for you of all the things I, Paul, could be doing. I'm praying because I know that my prayers are effective and powerful, and I'm committed to pray for you continually, that you continue in your following of the Christ. He uses that word Christ so many times in this book. And we talked about it a little bit last week, but it's interesting because uh, we're going to see that the Colossians are... Uh, being pulled from the gospel in two directions. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use words where I think one of them is uh, to tighten it and one of them is to add to it. 
And the tightening of their faith in Jesus would have been the Judaizer, Judaizers and the religious groups that said, hey, Jesus is great, but you also need this. For most of them, it was circumcision if you were a male. Hey, Jesus is great, but also do this. And, and think about it too. Let's not just be like, oh, it's an ancient group. We don't ever do anything. You can think about it in your own upbringing. Let's not speak it out loud and critique other churches because we're not flawless either. But there's groups in Christianity that say, hey, it's Jesus, but also if you don't believe this or this or if you do this. I actually walked in the doors this morning and I'm wearing flip-flops today because it's summer. I'm ready for it to be summer. And there are people, which I don't think you make a whole denomination out of this, but go, You're, it's illegal to preach in flip-flops. And it might be real. But they'll go, well, you need to, so that's the clothing one, right? You follow Jesus, but also wear fine linens. That's what it says in the Old Testament. If you don't do that, you're really not following Jesus. And so that's one way of tightening it, that they were forced with these Judaizers. And we mentioned and alluded to last week that there's something called the Gnostic set, and they would add to it. They wouldn't tighten it, they would add to it. Hey, Jesus, but also you can get to this higher level of knowledge. We think about it in our own is that, hey, Jesus is good, but like there's other ways that are pretty good too. I remember in California, I was talking to a girl that I had seen and I hadn't seen her for a while and she was at a Starbucks and I was with pastor friends. I have other friends other than pastor friends, by the way, okay? So I'm there and I'm like, hey, how's it going? And she's like, oh, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm with this church, blah, blah, blah. And she goes, oh, I'm like part of a church kind of thing too. And I go, awesome, what is it? And she's like, it's kind of like Buddhist, Hindu, Christian. And I go, so nothing like Christianity at all, you know? It's Jesus and then more things. It's, it's Jesus and then other things that are okay. And one of our biggest issues maybe today is that we think it's like not a tightening or maybe an adding, but a, a loosening. That we go, hey, Jesus is great, but you know those rules that they talk about? The, the Ten Commandments, those are old. The way Jesus tells you to live when he talks, like you can't really do that. So kind of just do what feels good. Like, let's loosen up the boundaries a little bit and realize that you're forgiven. It's okay. God will forgive you again, which is actually part of that is true. But they, they loosen things. And I think what Paul does when he's saying, hey, this is how I want to help an early church. All they, let's say that they were just worried about those two, tightening and adding. But we're worried about loosening and all these other things that we have in our world. How are you to live life? is the question. How do you live life? And what Paul does is he reduces things. And he is going to, in the next nine verses or so, paint one of the most beautiful in all of Scripture depictions of Jesus Christ that we have. He says, if you need one thing to make it through the hardships of life, the good things of life, the neutral things of life, the boring parts and the exciting parts of life, you need Christ. He's going to paint a picture of Christ, and let's look at verse 15 of chapter 1, and we will dive in. How do we live life well? This is how Paul equips them. Colossians 1 verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, thrones, powers, rulers, authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Let me pray for us. God, we thank you. 
Father, we praise you for sending your son. We praise you for leading your people for thousands of years and then through your son showing us just exactly who you are. Jesus, we praise you for coming to earth. I can't get past in this passage when it says uh, fullness dwelling, that all that God is was in you in a body and you were here to show us how committed, how, how valuable we are to you, how much you treasure us. God, we praise you for that. And Holy Spirit, we invite you. All the things that we have floating around in our minds. Would you uh, shift gears, turn direction, soften, motivate, encourage, even rebuke what we need, Spirit, you know. We pray as we look at this, would you speak to our hearts and our minds? Speak through me. We ask this all, and God's people said, amen, amen. So what does Paul do? He says, if you're going to make it through, you need to see Christ as supreme. He, he then talks about how you need to see yours, but he says, if you want to live life, you have to see Christ as the center of it. And then how do you see Christ as the center of it is you need to see him worthy of it. And he goes through, and there's so many different ways that people have diced these verses up to say, look at all the beautiful stuff that they say about Jesus the Christ. And I want to pick out eight of them. There's probably more. Eight of them that he highlights. And I would encourage you to jot some of these down. If you have your Bibles out, underline these in your scriptures. This passage, uh, before I started studying it, was one that I just skimmed over, and I'm guessing you might have done that too. But this passage is rich, maybe the richest depiction. John 1 is another good depiction, right? The light came into the world, and he made his dwelling among us. We've seen his fullness, right? We see Hebrews 1, that in times God spoke through prophets and different but now he's spoken through his son, the image. He's, he's the fullness. This one has both of those, and it's maybe even better. If you haven't underlined, highlighted this in your Bibles, on your phones, or in your hands, you need to. Four things first that I think that Paul will talk about. Christ being supreme is from creation. The first one we see in the very first verse, he says, verse 15, the Son is the image of the invisible God. Hebrews 1 resonates this. It says the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. The point Paul is making is if you want to see God, now you can look at Jesus. The image word that they used here references back to Adam being made in God's image. But he's saying that Jesus, the Christ, was actually the image. Not a replica, not a reflection, but the very thing, the very substance. If you're curious about how God acts, look at the image of God who is his son and you will understand. If you're curious what God would do or say or not do or not say, look at Jesus. He is the image of of God. Don't look anywhere else. Don't think anything else. Look to Jesus. He's the image. Secondly, he moves right on. He says he's the image. And then he says this weird phrase for us, the firstborn over all creation. It's a way of saying that he's the first of all. And Paul is saying this in a really beautiful thing is because the Old Testament understanding of a firstborn implied the priority of birth, but also dignity and superiority that comes with it. But we know that Jesus existed with the Father in eternity past. So just because he was born to Mary at some point doesn't mean that's when he started to exist. He was with God in creation. But what does this firstborn talk about? Is this basically saying that he precedes all creation in time? He was there before everything in the past, and he precedes all creation in rank. So go back as far as you want, and Jesus was there. Go as high as you want, and Jesus is more important than everything. He is supreme. He is 
preeminent. He is all of these great things. And Paul's just talked about two things in one verse. He is the image. Can you guys say image? He is the firstborn. Say firstborn. He goes on. Verse 16. Check this out. (laughs) For in him all things were created. Say all things. Does that mean he created good things and bad things? It means that he created everything that's not God. Everything that exists has been created by God, by the Christ. Paul goes on, in case you're curious, he says, All things were created, things in heaven and on earth, things that are visible and invisible, meaning things you can see, like this podium, and things you can't see, like the air around us, or the wind, or other things that are more spiritual than that you can't see. He continues, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. I heard a pastor say that on this, Jesus created the tanks that are rolling into Ukraine, just as he created the defenses that are trying to prevent those tanks from rolling in in Ukraine. He was the creator of all things. The funny thing about this, so if we say first, he's the image, say image. Second, he's the firstborn, say firstborn. Third, he is the creator, say creator. And this is the crazy thing about him creating is that he creates the the great theological phrase that you could jot down as ex nihilo. E-X-N-I-H-I-L-O. It means out of nothing. We see it in the story of Genesis is that when God, the Father, and the Son are there speaking things into existence, there's nothing. Next time you want to really blow your kids' minds and make them understand a little bit about God's creative power, they say, hey, let's color a coloring sheet. Be like, okay. And be like, all right, where is it? Be like, no, you just have to do it. Like, I'm not going to give you colors or a coloring sheet. And they're like, well, how would I, how would I do that? <laughs> For God to create, he doesn't need anything. For us to create, we just move around parts, don't we? We take a crayon and we take a sheet that are other things that we're not creating. And then we put them on there and we make this other thing out of different parts. Jesus, eternity past, creates from nothing everything. The awesome power. And we are three out of eight of the way through. And there's more that I'm skipping. He is the image. He's the firstborn. He's the creator. This next one always gets me. Keep reading with me. It says he's before all things and in him all things hold together. You say he's the image. You have to say it. He's the image. <laughs> say he's the firstborn. He's the creator. Say he's the sustainer. In him All things hold together. Some things, the good things, not the bad things, or all things. Meaning, if you're in Christ right now, He is literally holding your body together. He's holding these chairs together. If Jesus were to release His control of sustaining all things, we would spiral into billions of pieces and chaos. Not just our relationships and societies and political orders, though they sometimes seem like they're in chaos. They would be even more in chaos. Is it everything about us? If he's not sustaining us every single moment, we would spiral. And if you're here and you're like, I'm just here because my mom made me come. I don't really believe all this stuff. He's holding you together too. Whether you believe it or not, whether you appreciate it or not, the reason that you just took your last breath is because he allowed you to. The reason you woke up this morning, maybe you got to sleep in. Maybe you woke up before the sun rose. Whenever it was, was because he's sustaining you. Paul is painting a majestic picture of how high God is. He's trying to paint a picture of Everest. They might have a picture up there. Everest is the highest mountain in the world, right? 29,000 feet elevation. He's saying, look how great God is. Look how great God is. Look how great God is. His Christ, he's the image. He's the firstborn. He's the creator. He's a sustainer. All these things from forever past until this very moment and will continue on. And then I like the next four. They're a little different because I think he talks about them as he is over the church. Not just over creation in general, but how he is over us as his church. Keep reading with me. Verse 18, it says that he is the head. Say head. He is the head of the body of the church. This means both head and rank. He's in charge, but also head and biological importance. 
If I were to not have a head, <laughs> physically, I would be in a bad spot. Let's say that. I actually was in Kenya one time, and they asked me what I wanted for dinner, and they said chicken or pork or something, and I was like, chicken sounds good. And we came home later that day, and a guy showed up with three live chickens, and I was like, oh, like those chickens. <laughs> And he'd literally chop the head off and the chicken runs around. You know, I literally, I'd, I'd heard it run around like a chicken with your head cut off, but I saw it. <laughs> and then the chicken tasted different after that. That's for sure. He's the head. He is biologically a necessity for us as a body. And he's also, as us as a body, the most important if we're following a pastor or an organization or a band or a ministry and not following Christ first, it's like saying my pinky is more important than my head. Cut off my pinky, we can still get most things done. I might cry a little bit. Cut off the head, you're done. So he's saying keep him as the head. He is the head. Secondly, he then uses the word firstborn again. So say firstborn. You've already said it firstborn. He says he's the firstborn of the church, but this time he's talking about resurrection. Look at verse 18. He's the head of the body. That's the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. This is a picture that when Jesus rose from the grave, he is the first resurrected body. And this one has probably thousands of pages to unpack of commentary. And we could teach a year of sermons on the fact that he resurrected and what that means and what the people expected. But the picture is, church, if you want to know what your life is going to be like, what your physical body is going to be like for eternity, look at Jesus. It's crazy. What's crazier is the fact that oftentimes when we think about Jesus, we think of an ethereal ghost like, even though we go, oh no, he's always a son, we have pictures of his body, but right now he is in bodily form. He rose and then ascended in a body. Which, as a side note, speaks a lot to this Gnostic heresy that was going on that said the body's evil. You don't need to get the body, like get away from the body. Just worry about the spirit. Jesus resurrected. He is a body. He is the first body that rose. And you all will have glorified bodies, probably not the same as his. But it is a picture of what we are looking forward to. We see him walk through doors, but also talk to people and have meals. Ask questions and engage dialogue. We see him show up and appear to numerous people as the firstborn from among the dead, which is a great evidence to the fact of the reality of the resurrection. Study Jewish understanding of resurrection. They believed all people would resurrect on some day when God returned to right all wrongs. They never would have guessed nor even told in secret to someone else that one person might resurrect and it would be God. It was the furthest thing that they could have ever imagined. But Jesus is the firstborn. So when it comes to the church, say he's the head. He's the firstborn. Third, for God, verse 19, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Say fullness dwelling. There's something about this phrase that I cannot get past. When I get uh, confused on things, I try and study it. <laughs> the word fullness in Greek is the word pleroma. It's used a lot in Colossians. Uh, verse 9, verse 19, verse 25, chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, chapter 4, verse 17. Fullness means completeness. And then the word dwelling is ketokesai. <laughs> And it means to abide permanently. Church, we have in Jesus as our head and as the firstborn of all creation, of a new resurrection. In him, God's completely abiding permanently. Do you see that? The fullness dwelled. The fullness of God, everything that is God, was fully in Jesus. It almost comes back to the first thing that is the image of God. Don't look anywhere else. Every piece that you would ever need to get about God was in Jesus. And 
always. It's not changing. The last one. There's more in here. You probably are noting that I'm skipping through some of them. Verse 20, he says, And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. The last one, church say he is the reconciler. And that's a definite article. The reconciler. He's not a reconciler. He's not one of many. He is the only one. There's other passages that I would encourage you to jot down. And if you study, you percolate on the sermons after, you need to look over at Romans chapter 5, verse 10 and 11. They might have the verses up on the screen. Romans 5, verse 10 and 11 says, For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more? Having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. A different letter. These are all written by Paul. It would be 2 Corinthians. Look over there, chapter 5, verse 17. Romans 5, 10 and 11, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 20. Therefore, if any was in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled to us, us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us this message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. The beautiful thing about this is that he is the reconciler, not a reconciler, and the reconciler of all. I've heard Christianity described as the most exclusive, inclusive truth that exists. That all who would come would be reconciled. That all of us are available to be reconciled because of the work of Christ. Not some, not a few, all it is extended to. So do you see him as Everest? Put that picture back up there. We have these eight things and maybe you're like falling asleep. You're like, I've heard this before. You just kind of like read scripture. You didn't do anything special about it. (laughs) I think the prayer that I have, even as I looked at this and I heard this, I was like, man, I didn't see that the first time. Maybe you see it and you're like, that just isn't like moving me as much. Remember, what is Paul saying? This is how I want to equip you to make it through life, to live life fully. You're going to be surrounded by people who want to add to your faith. Yeah, Jesus, but also this. They're going to be surrounded by people who want to broaden it and say, no, no, you know, just loosen things up. You're going to be found by people who want to like tighten it up and say, oh, you have to do all these, these rules and follow all of these codes and do everything. And Paul is saying, let's reduce it. You know, what a, you know what a reduction is when you cook? Is you like boil something until it reduces and makes like a paste or something thick. I'm not a great cook, so I'm kind of spitballing it here. He reduces and said, it's all about Christ, but let me show you that Christ is Everest. If you have Christ, you have everything. And the mistake that we often make is we go, well, if Christ is everything, then I'm like Crowder's. You guys know Crowder's Mountain? There's a picture of it they'll probably put up. I'm Everest. No, Jesus is Everest. That's like 29,000. I'm like kind of Crowder's Mountain. I'm kind of, I'm okay. I'm a decent person, right? These are in my notes. I don't memorize these types of things. Crowder's Mountain is a 1,600 foot elevation. We're like, okay, so Christ is Everest. I'm down here. That's what the world would love to tell you. Hey, you're pretty good. Hey, just keep doing you. Trust your heart. Follow your gut. Pull yourself up. Own your truth. Which I don't even want to say that one anymore because it makes me cringe every time. If you like that phrase, repent. (laughs) Just kidding, sort of. We, we see Christ, and maybe we go, yeah, he is great. But like, I'm, I'm here. But man, I don't need to tell you, we're not even crowders. We're not even like sea level. Because what Paul goes into next 
is if Christ is Everest, the furthest point below that that we can paint on our planet is Mariana's Trench, which if you need a good little site, here's a picture from Mariana's Trench. There's no light <laughs> except for light that we emit, very little life. It's if uh, Everest is 29,000 feet, I believe, Mariana's Trench at the lowest point is 36,000 feet below sea level. There are 1,000 atmospheres of pressure that low, like what we're feeling now times 1,000. There's a great documentary, if you like documentaries, called The Challenger Deep, where uh, the guy who directed Avatar goes down 36,000 feet and lands at the bottom of Mariana's Trench, which it seems like a terrifying thing to do. I think what we have to do is see if Christ is Everest, we are Mariana's Trench, the lowest point, even lower than that. And Paul does it in one sentence. Look at verse 21. He just painted this beautiful picture that would make the church go, yeah, they're, they're clapping, they're singing. They're like, let's sing that hymn again. They just want to stay in it. And then he goes, and you, once, not now, but once, you were alienated from God. You were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. He spends the first six verses to praise the Christ, giving him eight or more awesome depictions. And then he uses one line and two phrases. He says, you were estranged and your enemies once. You were estranged you didn't want anything to do with God. You wouldn't know if he hit you in the face. You didn't know who he was or what he was like. You were as different from him as you ever could be. And you were enemies. What little you did know, you didn't want anything to do with him. And he says this phrase, which for me gets confusing, where he says, uh, in your hearts because of your evil actions. And I think it works both ways. When we're sinful, we do evil things. And we don't like God judging us. <laughs> And when we do evil things, our hearts become evil and we don't like God being a part of this world. It's one of the reasons they say that uh, adolescents, when they go to college, leave the faith in record numbers, not because they weren't discipled well, but because they're surrounded by a world who says, you should do other things. And they're reminded of this Christian faith that says, you should live this way. And they go, well, I don't like that God that tells me it's wrong. That's what Paul is pointing at. You're estranged and you're enemies. Paul is trying to let them know where they are in the world of this relation to Christ. He is high and above, exalted, the Everest of all Everests. You are Mariana's trench. <laughs> but now. Verse 22. I hope you haven't closed your Bible yet. But now. He has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death. Everything that we just discussed about who Christ is. I don't have them memorized. You probably don't either. Maybe you took great notes. He's the image, he's the first, he's the creator, he's the sustainer, he's the head, he's the firstborn, he's the fullness dwelling, he is the reconciler of all. You once were estranged in enemies, but now through the death of that beautiful thing, through the death of Christ, the painful death of Christ, you were reconciled through his agonizing, abandoning all of the different things that he went through for you. He was so good and you were so low, but he did it all for you. That's how you make it through church in Colossae. That's how you make it through 704 church. is by an incredibly high view of Christ, a perfectly realistic picture of yourself, and a realization that but now in Christ, he has paid the price for everything at huge cost so that you may live. Paul then finishes. It says in verse, let me read it, 22. He's reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish 
free from accusation. Friends, you know that in Christ, three things he describes about you here. You're holy. Set apart is what it means. The word can mean judicially perfect, meaning like in the court of law, but also spiritually perfect. That through Christ's death, you've been made perfect. The second thing he says is that you're without blemish. I kept thinking of the commercial for Maybelline. I don't know why I did this. Maybe it's Maybelline. Anybody else? I don't know why I looked. Uh, I know why I looked. Uh, blemish free. No inconsistencies. Everything flawless because of Christ's death. The third thing he says is without accusation. Unaccused. The enemy loves to accuse, but he says if you're in Christ, you've been reconciled, you can't be accused. It's like the enemy's words that he throws at you are just stopped short. Then the invitation is, what do we do? Everybody that I read, they've attempted to articulate this, I don't know what you would say, this reality. It's like describing the best meal you've ever had is edible. <laughs> I've struggled to find the words to describe this in its fullness. I like what uh, Matthew Henry says very simply. He says, you are at enmity with God, yet this enmity is slain. And a little bit more broadly, Stuart Townend wrote a great hymn, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. They might have the words up on the screen, but I think you know it. It says, How deep the Father's love for us, his, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns his face away, as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons I would add in daughters to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, in his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. It's funny because we want like <laughs> maybe John Maxwell books for how to live life well. We want like gurus and other things, which there's all of this good wisdom. I like all of that stuff too. I'm reminded by that. But Paul says, hey, if you want to last, if you want to live life in this world, make Christ the center. How do you make Christ the center? By making him worthy of the center. And he is absolutely and entirely and permanently worthy of the center of your life. He is Everest, your Marianas, but no more. You are with him because of his death. All he says right here in verse 23 is the last thing. If you continue in your faith. <laughs> he says established and firm. These are military terms. It meant an army that was ready. They're waiting. They're on guard. Think about a firm foundation, a structure built on rock. He says, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, verse 23, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel you've heard that's been proclaimed everywhere and that I'm a servant of. So what do we do with all that? Maybe we just fall at his feet and on our faces. I have a feeling that's probably not where everybody's at. Um, three things I think that we can do. Uh, is uh, three words. You can jot these down. Is that uh, after we hear something like that, we want or we make or we ask. I think a lot of us just want to spend time with him. We just want to worship him. We want to pursue him as central in our lives. We see all of those wonderful things. We're reminded of it. And we go, man, we just want to make time with him. 
That's all we want to do. I wish I had more time. I pray every morning and at lunch and in the evening. I wish I never had to stop praying. I'm reading the Bible in a year. I wish I was reading it five times a year and twice on Sundays. I don't know. I just want it. I think about it, the first relationship. When you start in a relationship with someone, you don't have to force anything, do you? Everything you do is around finding a way to spend time with them. <laughs> Why do you want to do that? Well, they're amazing. They're cute. <laughs> they're funny. They're smart. They smell good. <laughs> you know, they, they, we have similar interests. You, what you do when you start, you just want to be near someone. And if you're that, if you're here right now and you just want to be near them, I would encourage you with the passage from Matthew 6. He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If you're here this morning, you go, man, this reminds me, I just want to make much of God. I want to make time for him. I thank you that my treasure is Christ and my heart is right behind. I'm right there wanting to worship, wanting to praise, wanting to be obedient, wanting it, wanting it, wanting it. It's so good. I can't believe how good you are. Thank you for the reminder of how good you are. There's others that you don't want time with, you need to make time for. Maybe use this illustration too much, but we have kids. We love our kids, but sometimes we know that we need to make time for them. Do you know what I mean, parents? We see one of our kids really fighting for attention. We have three of them, and so there's a lot going on in our house. And one of them, you know, all of them are in our face at the same time. And I'm like, man, you guys all want my undivided attention. And because I love them, I try and make time for them. I'm not perfect. So we have, hopefully, our goal is like once a month, we'll go on daddy-child dates with each, like father-son, daddy-daughter. We call it bro dates with the guys, right? And it's funny because it doesn't matter what we do. We play video games. We'd go to McDonald's. We'd go to like Costco, which is amazing. And they're like, dad, can we do that again? Because I have undivided time with them. And I just, I put my phone away. As, if I'm good, I put my phone away and I just am like talking with them, listening. They ask ridiculous questions and I go, yeah, what about this? And I should make something else up ridiculous. And they're like, oh, yeah, that makes so cool. So for some of you in the room, you want it. You want Jesus. You're like, hey, Zephyrus, you're right. Fitting is so good. And then others of you are like, hmm. I know I need it. And so I need to make time. Matthew 6 has the same invitation for you. I love that that passage works both ways. Where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. It's specifically talking about money. But it means, hey, where are you passionate about? That's your treasure. You love it. And then it says, where do you want to be passionate? Friends, if you just read through this whole, you sat through this whole sermon and you could hardly stay awake, you need to make time for Christ. You know that he's the best thing for you, but your heart isn't moved to affection. I had the very same week. If that's you, you need to make time for him. I had the very same week. Because that leads me to the third point. Because maybe you're here and you go, I don't want to spend time with. I don't want to make time for. And so what's the last thing if you're here? I was going to ask you to raise your hands, but that's way too vulnerable, I think, for most of you. If you're here and you don't want to make time for Jesus, you don't even want time with Jesus, you're like, my heart's just so dark. St. John of the Cross was a 16th century Spanish theologian monk. And he talked about something called the dark night of the soul where it's just dry. Does it? You open the scripture and you're like, this is empty. There's nothing in here. You pray and you're like, I don't hear, I don't feel God at all. Maybe it's not that bad, but you're like, man, I need something. I think we pray what Moses prayed. Exodus 33, he says, show me your glory. So maybe you don't want, maybe you're not making time. But friends, this morning you can ask God to give you a heart that hungers for him. You can ask God to give you a mind that will set apart time for him. I will use my brains to plan my day, the rest of this day, Sunday, and this week, so that I make time. So I tell you what, there's people that are going to add stuff to your faith. There's people that are going to 
tighten things about your faith. There's things that are going to loosen things about your faith, and Paul is wanting to reduce it. Do you want to know how to live life? Keep Christ the center. How do you keep Christ the center? See him as worthy. How do you see him as worthy? Sometimes you got to ask. God, I need to see you as worthy. I mentioned my week this week. It was just a weird one. We've had great stuff going on. And then uh, I, have a, I have a spiritual director, which is like a counselor, but Christian. And we pray. He kind of leads me. He's like, hey, this is an impression. And it's, for some people, maybe it's super uncomfortable, whatever. And uh, this week I was supposed to have that. And so I went down early, like 45 minutes. I just didn't want to be late. And then it found out that it was canceled. And so I was pr- planning on just having silence and like read my Bible and pray a little bit and journal and then have my spiritual direction for an hour. And then I had like another hour and a half until a doctor's appointment. I was like, I'm just going to take that whole time. I'm not going to have my phone on. I'm just going to be in the word and pray. I haven't had, I used to call it solitude and silence. I'm calling it soul care now. Hadn't had soul care since I can remember. Right? And I I just go, God, I'm not super hungry for you. I want to want you. I'm I'm sort of making time, but I know I need to make better. I know I I can do this better. If I want to be a good son to you, if I want to be a good husband, if I want to be a good dad, if I want to be a good friend, if I want to be a good pastor, I know I need to make that time. And so I just was like, God, what is wrong? I need you more in my life. And I'm still on a journey. But I tell you the difference of asking him in that time. One point I just sat down and just listened. Just said, what do you want to say to me? What would you want to say to someone right now who doesn't want time and isn't making time as they should? And I would invite you, wherever you are, there are so many other people. Maybe it's me that's in the room that is in a similar spot as you. Christ is amazing. If you want him this morning, we're going to worship. I would ask you just to worship. Make much of him. If you know you need to make time for him, maybe this response time is you saying, so how do I do it differently? I I want him, but I just haven't made the time. How do I change it? And if you don't have either of those and you go, but I know that I need those things, would you ask him this morning? Literally pray the prayer out loud. Jesus, would you give me a desire for you? Jesus, would you give me a mind to plan it out? Because I know that I need you, but right now I don't put you in my life the way it should be. This is, friends, the only way we're going to make it through. (laughs) But it's not just the way that we can make it through. It's the way that we can make it full. The way that we can live our lives the way God intended it is by keeping Christ at the center. Would you stand with me? If you're new to the church, we're going to continue to worship and we will have a prayer team that is on this first row. If you need prayer, maybe it's, hey, I need to, I don't really want Jesus, but I know I need to want him. I don't, I'm not really making time with him, but I know I need to make time. Would you pray for me that I would have a heart that hungers for him and thirsts for him? There's people that would love to pray for you. If you don't want to come down, it's fine. Would you pray that in your own seat? Let me pray for us as we continue to worship. Father, we praise you for your word. Holy Spirit, I pray that right now you would do your work in the room. Jesus, would you move in the hearts and minds of people? There's people here who are hurting. They feel guilty and maybe shameful because they don't have the life that they think they should be living or they're not as hungry for you as they want to be. But God, you're right here. Would you move in our midst right now?